Well, welcome to MarsCon, everybody. I'm Gerald Nordley. I write science fiction as G. David Nordley, so that's what you'll see on con literature. And I have a talk here about what to do about when the sun doesn't shine on the moon. And uh, I call it energy on the dark side of the moon for the dark side of the moon. And that lasts two weeks. The moon, of course, goes around the Earth. Uh, and I, <laughs> my clock wasn't synchronized, so I, <clears throat> there, there were in. Uh, the lunar night lasts two weeks long. And people want to do things uh, during the lunar night, like explore and uh, maybe make oxygen or mine water and all of that. So there's a need for having power when the moon is, when, <laughs> when the sun is shining on the moon. Um, okay. Oh, there it went. <clears throat> uh, we want to operate rovers, instruments, factories making air and water and fuel. Uh, and uh, this sort of assumes that we aren't uh, allowed even small nuclear power plants. Uh, if we are, of course, that's a whole different game. We'll look at uh, batteries, channeled sunlight, beam microwaves, lasers and photocells, and we'll look at the polar and the night applications of that. Uh, since we're only going to do 20 slides, we're not going to look very deeply, but we will touch the subjects. <clears throat> On top here, you see the lunar orbit to scale. Here's the Earth, and there's the moon, and they're in their proper sizes and at the distance to scale. This is one of the very few times that you can actually do an astronomical uh, uh, image <laughs> that is to scale and get everything in. But uh, there we are. Uh, down here, this is not to scale, but we want to get everything in. Uh, Earth goes around the uh, sun in a slightly eccentric orbit, not very eccentric. You hardly notice it, but it's actually uh, closer to the sun in January than it is in July. Uh, <clears throat> the moon goes around the Earth, and its orbit is somewhat more eccentric, uh, about half a uh, 0.05, I think, thereabouts. And it has a definite perigee, and its line of apsides, and that's the uh, line across the major axis of the moon's orbit, rotates as it goes around. And then every 8.85 years, that goes around. And the uh, plane of the moon also changes. Um, it turns out that the moon's orbit is actually a classic example of chaos mathematics. It's kind of predictable, but in detail, not so predictable. And people have a lot of fun with uh, how it can change. Uh, we all know about the L1, L2, L4, and L5 points. Uh, they are nominally 60 degrees ahead and 60 degrees behind the moon and its orbit around the Earth. These are stable points. The gravity of the Earth and the moon and the centrifugal force of the uh, moon's orbit all balance out at these points. The L1 and L2 point, uh, the balance isn't quite as good. Uh, if you displace something in the L4 or L5 point, it kind of does a little thing like that and stays in the general area. If you displace something from an L1 or L2 point, that displacement grows until it's not really at the point anymore. So <clears throat> that is a consideration in terms of the stability of placing things in these uh, locations.
This is the side view of that. It turns out that the lunar equator is actually very close to the ecliptic plane. Uh, and that may have something to do with the moon's origin or may not. Uh, but uh, what it means is that there are pl places on the north and south pole of the moon that the sun never shines because the heels of the craters get in the way. And in those very dark places, water freezes. And we have, in fact, de detected a lot of uh, water there. And people are interested in mining that water for rocket fuel and for just living on the moon. Of course, to do that, they need power. Of main, the main interest is Shackleton Crater. And here, here's where the moon's south pole is. And Shackleton Crater is a deep, uh, bowl-like crater that's uh, almost right at the south pole. So it is pretty dark all the way through. Another important crater is uh, de Gerlach. De Gerlach. Uh, he was Belgian, I believe. And uh, he, uh, his crater has a very high ridge along here. And you see these, uh, these dark areas. Uh, they are in almost perpetual light. Well, the bottom of Shackleton Crater and parts of de Garilash and some of these other craters are in perpetual darkness. So one of the obvious things to do is, well, put the solar cells up on the uh, uh, rim of Shackleton Crater and redirect the light down into the crater to power stuff during the lunar night or, or any time if you're talking about Shackleton Crater. And here is a, um, a lunar orbiter view. Uh, this is a, uh, a synthetic view that shows the altitudes and everything. And uh, you see these craters here, those are those ones and you see those there and that that's those are those so this is a actual uh, uh, lunar orbiter picture and I've uh, added a little uh, tower there and show laser rays shining into Shackleton crater hopefully hitting some solar cells and power powering stuff in there This is a different part of the moon's orbit. Do you see the, uh, it's a different side of Shackleton and Der Gerlach craters are lit up now, but the bottoms are still dark. The Shoemaker over here, uh, Bill Shoemaker was one of the people that finally put the nail in the coffin of uh, ideas that lunar craters were caused by something other than meteor impacts. So he, He's one of the heroes of understanding the moon. Um, anyways. So what we think we can do is redirect sunlight or laser light from something other than the sun from a peak down to a user in this crater. If you redirect sunlight it gets heat as well as uh, a useful power, and that can be helpful. Uh, but I should know about how cold it gets on the moon or in space. Uh, you're in a pretty good vacuum. In fact, you can think of yourself as being in a thermal, uh, a thermos bottle. Uh, the problem is sometimes not whether you're going to get cold, it's whether uh, you're going to get too hot. You have to balance. The only way of getting rid of heat uh, in these circumstances is by radiation. So you have to have the right emittance and the right absorptance uh, of whatever you, is covering you. Otherwise, you may get too hot as well as get too cold. Uh, 
but uh, you do want a little bit of energy, and uh, most spacecraft include some uh, radioactive uh, materials to just keep things above absolute zero, to keep them from radiating too much energy. But you're probably not uh, going to want to try and do an industrial operation in RTGs. You're going to want a lot more power than that. Um, redirecting light is one option. You can do it with a uh, optics, with the transparent optics that, that are uh, oh, configured, slanted uh, in various ways to cause the light to bend and go that way. Or you can also do it with mirrors. One advantage of doing it with mirrors is that you get all of the wavelengths in the same direction at the same focus. The other way, as uh, indicated here, is you get sunlight or lasers, you convert those into electricity, use the electricity to drive a microwave or laser array, and that goes and powers the user. And some people have even thought, well, we can just do a very long fiber optic cable. Uh, it's about, I think, 30 kilometers across here in Shackleton Crater. So people have actually done cables that long and sent power through them. NASA has a uh, initiative, they call it Watts on the Moon Challenge. And they're looking for all sorts of ideas from people about how to power their uh, operations in the bottom of Shackleton Crater and other places where the sun doesn't shine. If you are interested in contributing ideas and making a program, there's the website to uh, go to. I, I don't know if it's in this particular thing, but I think the deadline is coming up like the end of the month or thereabouts. So you might want to, if you're really interested in this, check it out fairly soon. Uh, this is sort of one of the crazy ideas, uh, the kind of crazy ideas that they uh, might be looking for. This is my crazy idea, so don't blame Elon for this. Uh, my thought was that, well, a, a, a 50 meter starship, lunar starship, uh, is a pretty good uh, uh, example of a tower. So why not just cover the whole top of it with solar cells? Uh, that way, nothing has to turn. Well, the moon goes around the orb its orbit and Earth, and it turns around with respect to the sun. It just different solar cells get illuminated round and round. Um, you're going to get about, uh, you, you don't get all of it, but you get about 357 kilowatts, which is, uh, which is enough to keep a, a number of nice things going. Uh, and if you uh, use some of the Starship's uh, capacity for carrying things, you maybe have 50 tons worth of batteries there. Uh, then you've got enough to uh, take care of any uh, accidental or slow-term power outages. These things we call the peaks of eternal lightness uh, aren't actually perfect in that respect. They may have a few days of uh, not lightness that you need to cover, and so you might want to have batteries to do that. Um, you're being reasonably close by, a, uh, an electronically steerable microwave array might be a good way to go. We have uh, radars that are electronically steerable and uh, should be able to do that with power beams as well. Uh, eliminating rotating machinery does a lot for the reliability of equipment in space. Uh, 
talking about uh, the redirection or beaming of uh, sunlight or lasers, one thing we want to do is we want to get most of the energy that we're beaming to get the target we're beaming at. Uh, there's a equation for diffraction limited resolution here, and that's the uh, uh, resolution equals 1.22 lambda, which is the wavelength of light you're using over the uh, dimension of the ray, the, uh, basically the diameter, though it may not be a circle, so that may mean something else. And See, a milli arc second uh, is about the apparent diameter of uh, Proxima Centauri. A very large telescope uh, in UV IR, that's this guy over here, uh, uh, gets about 50 milli arc seconds uh, to, well, it depends, uh, the, the 8.2 meter, that's a single unit. Uh, we'll get you uh, uh, 50 milli arc seconds and the 130 meters, which is the whole constellation, can you get you down to one milli arc second. Uh, and there's a uh, uh, another example of a uh, large array. Anyways, this is standard technology, at least in microwaves, and uh, something one can easily adapt to lunar circumstances. <clears throat> now, how do you make the mirrors, if you're going to use mirrors, uh, to redirect sunlight or laser light? And you're going to want to do this uh, over a fairly long distance, so you're going to need a big mirror. But you can use uh, a uh, metal coated thing like uh, aluminized uh, mylar. Uh, and uh, the one mil aluminized mylar weighs about 34 milligram. Like 34 milligrams, that's uh, 34,000 micrograms, which is 34 milligrams uh, per meter squared. So uh, unless your mirror is very, very big, we'll see examples of that later, but uh, you can probably afford the weight. You also need, of course, a, a frame of some sort uh, and a steering mechanism. That's probably going to weigh more than the mirror itself. <clears throat> I did a quantitative example of the transmission beam spot size uh, versus distance transmit aperture and the target radius. I'm holding the target radius uh, at one meter. You know, that's, that's reasonable for a small rover doing stuff around. Uh, and uh, looking here, at optical versus X-band. In optical, your wavelength is about uh, five millionths of a meter uh, or 500 nanometers. In X-band, it's about a couple centimeters. Now, uh, for a 6,000 kilometer distance, uh, a 1.8 meter aperture will do you uh, fine. Uh, and the mass of the ref reflector is uh, in the uh, you know, one ten thousandth of a kilogram. That's, uh, that's a very light sort of thing. And uh, of course, with the steering and all of that, it would be much more, but it easily accommodate, you could easily accommodate that in the satellite. Excuse me a moment. <coughs> okay, back with you. Uh, but if you go further away, uh, a 6,000 mile orbit or uh, apogee, apaloon, 
be something that we can consider. I'll show you the orbits later. Uh, if you're going to go to the L1 or L2 point, that's about a 60,000 kilometer distance. And factor of 10 increase in the aperture. Now you need an 18 meter thing and it's a uh, uh, well, 8.6 grams, that's not too bad. Fairly sizable thing though to, uh, to steer around and all of that. Uh, if you tried to do that with X-band, um, you now have 720 kilometers. I should have mentioned the X-band version of the uh, 6,000 uh, kilometer thing. That was uh, 72 kilometers. Um, well, thank you very much. Just a moment. <clears throat> Which, even if you're talking about mylar, uh, weighs something, <laughs> 138 tons. But um, you get out to 60,000 and you are, you know, 10 times as heavy, uh, over a thousand tons. And I also included a, a line about what if you were to try and do this from Earth? Just go ahead and uh, plug in your uh, aperture and thing on planet Earth and shoot it at one of those uh, uh, peaks of uh, perpetual luminosity or, or maybe a subreflector up there somewhere. And then to get down to a one meter radius, and I, you might not really want to do that. You might want to go for a sub reflector that's quite a bit bigger, but uh, you would need an aperture of uh, 120 meters. I think they have or are thinking about telescopes that are going to be almost that large or at least an array of two or three telescopes of that size to do that in optical. So it's something you, and might want to consider actually is just uh, beaming it straight from Earth. Uh, but if you go to expand, th this now becomes really impractical in terms of the, the mass of the reflector and the aperture. Uh, you'd be at something talking about something the size of the planetary telescope uh, and trying to use that to transmit energy. It might not work that well. Okay, this is the 6,000 mile orbit I was talking about. You have an Apollon. How am I doing on time? I'm okay. Okay, Apollon and a Paralon. And uh, it's close there. This is sort of a, a Molnaya type orbit, actually, uh, which the Soviets used for uh, hanging a, a satellite over their far north regions. Uh, it, it's better for them than equatorial uh, space craft. But the thing, it, it sweeps through perigee quickly and goes out slow, just hangs up there for hours and hours and then falls quickly back and goes up like that. <clears throat> One of the things you can do is you can make, because the, uh, the direction of the dark side of the moon changes 360 degrees over the course of the year, because the earth takes the, you know, about one degree per day to get around. So the uh, dark side of the moon is that way, and then that way, and that way, and that way. And if you want your Apolloon to be over the dark side, the orbit has to change as well. Now there are very way, various ways of causing orbits to precess like that. Uh, we do that in what are called sun synchronous satellites around Earth and we use the equatorial bulge and some useful mass concentrations to cause that sort of precession. Moon has plenty of mass concentrations but uh, you also may have a fairly big array on this power satellite, and you can use that as a solar sail to help make your orbit adjust. Uh, something called Modi engineering, if anybody remembers uh, Niven and 
uh, Purnell's The Mote in God's Eye. Uh, the, Mote, the Motis were very good at making one piece of structure do three or four different things. And that's a good thing to do for spacecraft as well. It saves weight. At any rate, this uh, would hang up over the dark side of the moon and uh, uh, and keep its apolloon away from the sun, which is where you want it. I have some, I wrote some software that's a strict the Keplerian stuff. It doesn't handle mass concentrations and perturbations and things, but it just gives you a good idea of uh, uh, how long the satellite would hang up over the dark side of the moon. Uh, and it would be above the horizon for in a 12 hour orbit. It would be above the horizon for 9.78 hours. It would be above 25 degrees for over eight and a half hours, uh, which is, you know, it basically two thirds of the uh, uh, orbit, which might be good enough, uh, especially if you have batteries uh, to power it. Satellite is on the other side of the moon, uh, or you can have two satellites and you would have a, a 24 seven coverage that way. <clears throat> Another thing people have talked about, and this is getting uh, kind of far in the future now, is a uh, running a uh, power network all the way around the moon. So when there's power on the moon during the day, it can uh, uh, be tapped on the backside. Well, the uh, a neat thing about doing that is if you run it all in the same direction, just make a superconducting wire around the moon, you can get yourself an artificial magnetosphere, uh, provide some radiation protection, uh, depending on how much power you run through there, it can be enough to uh, be almost as good as Earth's and enough to keep the uh, lunar atmosphere in place if you want to have one. Uh, so that's that's another one of these crazy ideas, but it's probably uh, more for uh, the later part of the century than uh, next few years. So that is uh, about the end of what I had to say about all of this. I uh, have some things to think about. Uh, we'd be using the power in the uh, uh, north to, uh, no, that, that would be, or north and that would be the south, uh, to mine lunar water. But lunar water would be an extremely scarce resource. Uh, if you're talking about a base of a few dozen people, that's probably not that big a concern. If you're talking about making rocket fuel for starships. Uh, maybe you want to get that somewhere else. But I mean, that's that's something to be thinking about. The thing reason about thinking about it now is once things get into a, a habit, they're very hard to change. Uh, so one wants to set the ground rules early if one can. Another thing that has kind of worried me, and I haven't heard other people worry about it, so maybe I'm being a little bit uh, of a worry wart, but uh, the moon has almost no atmosphere right now. Uh, it's nice, it's high vacuum, and there's some goodness in that. Uh, if you aren't going to go ahead and just terraform the moon, uh, it's nice to maybe keep it uh, that way. But if you start a chemical industry like uh, making oxygen out of rocks and uh, making rocket fuel out of uh, uh, lunar carbon and uh, uh, lunar water, uh, that's going to produce a, a you know very small but discernible anoxious atmosphere that uh, might uh, 
actually give problems to some of the people who want to use the moon's natural vacuum. Having a, having a gravity field and natural vacuum is kind of a, a scarce resource in itself. So uh, it's, it's something we might want to think about. Uh, we could just ship the raw material from the moon to factories at L1 and L2, for example, and there wouldn't matter. All, all of the pollution would just be blown away uh, to where the supernovas play. Uh, and we'd have a hard time, you know, e even the, <laughs> the worst of the... Uh, uh, People who worry about uh, hum human beings doing too much, it's, it would be a long time before we compete with the supernova as far as pollution is concerned. But any rate, uh, the point I was making about that is decisions made now will set the stage for millennia and more. And we need to think about what kind of moon does all humankind want. And with that, that's the uh, uh, end of my talk and if there are any questions uh we'll go ahead i'm gonna stop the screen share but we can always start that again and come back hi Yeah, it's, uh, did somebody else say something or was that an echo of me? Okay. Uh, yeah, we have a lot of thinking and doing. The, uh, the Lunar Treaty, I get the Space Treaty and the Moon Treaty mixed up on occasion, but I think it's the Moon Treaty no, it's the space treaty that we're working on now that was a 1968 UN thing. Uh, and then the uh, lunar treaty never got uh, signed. But at any rate, that was more restrictive on what you could do. Uh, but uh, we, you want people to be able to do something. Uh, we want people to be able to settle on the moon. We want people to you know, explore. We want it to be uh, a place where people can go. At the same time, we don't want to destroy it. We've come close enough to doing that to our planet, so we want to uh, we want to be careful about that. And uh, yeah, yeah, I think we need to be thinking about it. We need to be thinking about the, how much lunar lunar resources we use given that if we can get to the moon, we can get to the asteroid belt and there's all sorts of stuff out there already broken up for us uh, and uh, without a gravity field to uh, mine out of. So yeah, how much how much we industrialize the moon is a, is a question uh, that we need to be thinking about. I, and I, I don't think the answer is zero, but I don't think the answer should be uh, you know, use the whole thing up and uh, spit out the husk either. Okay, had to had to find the mic button. Um, <laughs> I thought that none of the space-bearing uh, countries, meaning. Uh, China and uh, Russia and the U.S. ever signed the space uh, treaties. Only uh, countries that did not have a space program, such as uh, Belize and some of the others, had uh, signed it. But uh, pretty much everybody signed the 1968 treaty. The uh, the subsequent one, which I'm going to say is the Moon Treaty, and probably yeah. it's it's you know either one or the other, and I, I get them 
uh, mixed up, but uh, that one, uh, that that is the one that was more restrictive and that the spacefaring countries did not sign. Yeah, I, I, I know that we signed the thing saying that we would not park uh, nuclears in in space, but keep them on the ground. But other than that, yeah. that, that was the only thing that really stuck. Well, it it also uh, said that uh, nations could not appropriate uh, cosmic yeah, a, bodies. Yeah, a, the, a they country couldn't. could not claim yeah. a, a body, but it was kind of big on what its citizens could do. Yeah. So. As long as you're not going to take the whole thing. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, do we have any sort of feels to, like, have we uh, quantized uh, how much ice is at the South Pole? Like, there is, you know, like, a, enough to fill up X number of uh, Saturn Vs or whatever, or fill, like, a uh, Michigan or whatever uh, visualization that you want to do. Uh, do we I, actually have a quantitative uh, number yet? I don't think so. Uh, not not a good one, at any rate. Uh, I've I've seen some and others go by that were quite a bit different, and uh, and I tell you, my memory isn't working that well right now. I I did look at that, and I, it's out of my mind right now. But the the issue is is like a lot of other things that you mine. Uh, there's more there, but you have to work for. You have to work harder, increasingly harder at it. Mm -hmm. There's uh, some low-hanging fruit. Uh, there might be some uh, hard ice near the surface uh, uh, in Shackleton Crater and so on. But there's also a lot of stuff that's just uh, uh, embedded in lunar soil all over the place that if you process enough, you know, like, like uh, helium, that, that if you rip up enough lunar surface and process it, you can get at it but uh, uh, one thing I think I remember is there may be being as much water on the at the poles of the moon and these frozen craters the enough to fill Lake Erie or something like that which is a, a lot of water but uh, if we start you know, using it as if it were going to last forever, it wouldn't. Yeah, I was sort of uh, wondering which would be, you know, if you needed a, you know, liter of a water, would it be better to get it from the uh, lunar poles or go all the way out to uh, Saturn as far as Delta B was concerned and all of that sort of stuff. But I, I guess it also depends on how easily you can make something that gets it off off from that location to wherever you are. I'm fighting with my computer here. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah. As I'm an advocate of going to series for water. Uh, it takes more time to get out there, but the Delta V really isn't that much different than uh, going to the moon and taking off again. And especially if you can use a, an electromagnetic catapult a, a series to get the water back. Uh, and the series is, uh, well, it's really the, it's the smallest planet. Uh, and it's got a lot of ice. It's maybe 100 kilometers of, of uh, dirty, salty ice uh, layer there. So there's probably not much running out of uh, series water anytime soon. So I think that's a better place to go for water than the moon uh, in, you know, 50 years or so. Mm -hmm. I, I know that, you know, that uh, water and its uses was one of the uh, plot points of the a book and TV series called The Expanse. So I always, yeah. whenever I watch that, I always think, okay, so what, you know, what are the economics, you know, which would really be the cheaper to do or I get but yeah well they uh, of course for something like the expanse they uh, they want a dramatic series and they want a dark feel and they want to have uh, all sorts of uh, uh, people in uh, 
you know, being exploited and, uh, you know, uh, all of that. I don't really think uh, anything like that is going to happen in the asteroid belt. Uh, you're probably going to need a PhD to get out there. <laughs> and uh, robots are going to do all the work. Yeah, I would uh, hope all the uh, robots. I mean, I grew up in the oil fields of on North Dakota. So I kind of know what, you know, happens to the actual workers who do the real hard work. And I know a lot of the real, real hard work has been replaced by all robots and moving pipes and stuff like that that yeah. used to mess up a couple of people for a year when I was out there. But uh, I've seen some really cool uh, robots that, you know, move the pipe. And it's quite interesting yeah. to watch. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, I think you'll... Another thing I get, you know, uh, you'll see on series, and maybe you'll see on the moon too. That depends on how well people adapt to one sixth gravity. Uh, is a rotating uh, colony that's uh, actually attached to the surface. If you remember one of those uh, tilt a whirl amusement park rides, uh, uh, you know where it spun around and around and uh, the, through you, you know. It's uh, maybe a couple three G's against the back against your back, uh, even though you're uh, in one G. You can uh, you can build something that uh, rotates for artificial gravity, and also uses a little bit of the natural gravity. And your floors are a bit tilted, though they won't necessarily feel that way. Uh, okay. And. Uh, it, it's a section of a parabola uh, that that's the way the force forces work out. So you're, uh, uh, you can have uh, dig parabolic pits and uh, fill them with uh, rotating space colonies on series and you'll have enough gravity to uh, keep you healthy. Okay. It looks like we're running out of time. So I'll, I'll let you close and thank you for a very nice uh, presentation. Well, thank you for coming, Ben. <laughs> but nice to get a larger audience. Thank you very much, Natasha, for being an audience as well. And uh, you're up to like a, a dozen or a solo. So. Oh, there there were more people. Oh yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. Great, great. Uh, now I have I have stuff uh, uh, I'm supposed to say yeah. to that dozen or more people. Uh, mention that MarsCon is happening online all weekend with events on YouTube, Discord, Twitch, and Zoom. More details may be found on our website, marscon.org. Other optional talking points. Check out the GPS charity auction. Buy some Girl Scout cookies. Oh, oh, do I miss MarsCon in person and getting those Girl Scout cookies. Oh, those thin mints. Uh, and other events coming up like reading panel or other event that you are excited about. And I've, uh, I've looked, they've got a good schedule, a, a one click access schedule on the website uh, and you've got all of that neat stuff uh, on there. So go check that one out. And thank you very much for coming. And be sure to catch um, uh, Jerry and myself uh uh, tomorrow for our our uh, Biden space uh, yes. discussion. Yes, our Biden our time this time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Take care. Take care.